see you this morning. Let us worship God together. What a day for celebration. What a day to rejoice. The Spirit of God is in our midst. God has come to be with us. Bring your hearts before Him. We worship Him in word and song and prayer. Be filled with hope and joy. For we have a God who loves us, who knows us and wants to be with us. Let us pray. Good and faithful God, meet us in this place, in this hour, we pray. Comfort and confront us, delight and disturb us, exhort and expose us, inspire us to generosity, fidelity, and courage. Leave us not unchanged by having been in your company and in the company of your saints. Guard us from any wishful thinking that worship is just in another day. We pray in the name of Jesus as he taught, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord and proclaim his greatness. Let the whole world know what he has done. Exalt in his holy name. Rejoice, you who worship the Lord. Search for the Lord and for his strength. Continually seek him. 
Remember the wonders he has performed, his miracles and the rulings he has given. He called for a famine on the land of Canaan, cutting off its food supply. They bruised his feet with fetters and placed his neck in an iron collar. Then Pharaoh sent for him and set him free. The ruler of the nation opened his prison door. He could instruct the king's aides as he pleased and teach the king's advisors. All this happened so that they would follow his decrees and obey his instructions. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. I would like to point out one portion of that uh, verse from Psalm. Until the time came to fulfill his dreams, dreams that God had given him for the Lord tested Joseph's character. Sometimes plans don't go our way when things become hard. Remember, we learn better from our mistakes, and a mistake is well worth it if we learn to do something different because of it, and that God has his hand in testing us to make us stronger and more able to do the things that he has prepared for us. Some of the things on the slides, I, I think I changed it too late last night for Kevin to recognize it. So the board meeting is not the 19th, it is the 18th. And today at 11.15, we are having the uh, 250th team meeting. Um, those were a couple of the things that I had changed on the slides. Remember that this Saturday is our monthly cookout. Uh, and then the 18th is the board meeting, Monday night, not Tuesday night. I want you to hear this. We'll tell you again next week, and it will be in written form next week. On August 24th, after church, we will have a special church meeting. The governing board has requested a chance for the church to vote on large ticket items as we're proceeding with some of our restoration. August 24th, that's two weeks from today, after church, we will be having a special church meeting. And again, the reminders about filling out a church directory form and your forms for the banquet ticket money. Four have not told us what they need for foods. So we need that process. Take and at the bottom, I'm going to ask that you uh, read about the art contest. We're continuing with our pastor bios. We're on our 17th pastor, the Reverend Dr. Herman William Vetchen, uh, who uh, has a doctorate, uh, earned a doctorate degree as well. He served here from 1893 to 1926. He was our longest serving pastor and he, our only pastor emeritus. He was ordained June uh, 14th 1893 here in this church. Uh, he was born in 1861 in Germany. So he came over to the uh, United States uh, when he was about 10 years old and naturalized when he was about 30. And he lived with us uh, in um, mostly in Rhode Island. He, he died in Providence in 1939. His parents were Ernest Henry Vetchen and Louisa Dorothea Betcher. They were married May 20th, 1891. 
uh, no, not they were married. He married on May 20th, 1891, his first wife, Clarissa, also known as Clara Sophia Estes in Providence. She was born in 1867 and died in 1927 in Newport, New Hampshire. He married a second time in 1929, less than two years after his first wife died. Uh, married Edna Rosira Snelling, who was born in 1870 in Northbridge, Massachusetts. Uh, and she died in 1958 in Pawtucket. There were three children. The first children, Albert, was born before he came to Warren. The next two children were born while they were here in Warren, uh, Herman and Olive. His, uh, he went to Colby Academy, um, and later to Brown University, where he was a member of the Delta Upsilon fraternity. Uh, he uh, followed that with a uh, uh, training at Newton Theological Institution. And it wasn't until 1914 that Brown University gave him his honorary doctorate degree. He was acting pastor of Sales Memorial Church in Salesville, Rhode Island, during his undergraduate days while he was attending Brown. Uh, Warren was his first pastorate that he was called to officially. And while he was here, he refused a call from Central Baptist in Middleborough to stay here, and he also refused a call to the Board Street Church in Central Falls to stay here. And when he did finally leave here, he went to the First Baptist Church in Newport, New Hampshire, uh, until his final days. It is Dr. Jen who was here when the church was remodeled and looked made to look like you see it today, and the James Vance Cole window was installed. He was the pastor that was here during that time. Um, when he was attending Brown, he earned a, uh, an award, uh, first place award um, prize by members of the sophomore class of Brown University. Uh, at the commencement, uh, he, he was a speaker at the commencement and spoke on England's case against home rule. While he was in Warren, he served on the school committee. He was the chaplain of the Warren Artillery for 20 years. He was the chaplain of the Washington Lodge Masons. He was a member of the Providence Theological Circle. And as I said before, he was our longest serving pastor and our only pastor emeritus, the Reverend Dr. Herman William Vetchen. Don't be afraid, Jesus said. Take courage, I am here. If the ushers would come forward and receive our morning tithes and offerings.
God of abundant grace and compassion. You heap blessings on us with reminder that we have been blessed to be a blessing to others. As we offer our tithes and offering this morning, we remember that we live in a world so, where so many don't have enough meat or clean water to drink. The words that Jesus spoke to his disciples clear them to eat. As we put these gifts in your hands and lift our eyes to you in gratitude, bless the gifts and multiply them to eat the need of many. Jesus the Christ. Amen. Let us sing together, God of grace and God of glory. Today is Matt 14, 22 to 33. Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross the other side of the lake. While he sent the people home, after sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting They were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came towards them, walking on the water. When the disciples came on the water, they were terrified. In their, fear, in their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said, take courage. I then Peter called to him, but you, tell me to come to you, walking. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. But Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? 
When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshipped him. You are the son of Let us honestly confess our shortcoming God, whose love never lets us go. How easy it is for us to see others in terms of black and white and allow ourselves shades of gray. How quickly we others by what they and how quick we are to give excuses for our actions. How easy it is for us to look as someone is spending their money and how fast we are to make allowances for our own spending habits. How readily we hold others to the rules and how quick we are to allow ourselves to bend the rules to justify our own actions. We are so eager to hold everyone accountable to the letter of the law and to give only ourselves a measure of grace. So, God, for playing you in these moments of stillness, release us from the harshness of our ways and fill us with he might, which has so graciously been given to us. Hear the good news. The grace of God surrounds us and goes before us, and God's love for us is stronger than our misdeeds. You are forgiven. Receive this good news in the breath of God's forgiving love. Your, your grace and your forgiving Lord that we dare to come before you with our request for others. We pray that you be with Joe's brother, Ken Cody, and with Deb's sister, Angie, as they fight their battle. That you would be with the health care workers in Africa during this Ebola crisis. We pray that you would be with the doctors working with Howard Huftelin and with his family during this time. We do praise you that Howie Huftelin is preparing to return to his home after being hospitalized and in the nursing home. Lord, there are others who are close to our hearts that we lift before you this morning. We pray your blessings upon them and upon your body, the church. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
Or text Moses writes that the law's way of making a person right with God requires obedience to all ends. This more command and dealing with just the Sabbath. That's 24 chapters on one day. Just think of all of the other things. The only way to be right with the law is to keep every single way of getting right with God says, 
patriarchs who will go up to heaven to bring Christ down to earth. And don't say who will go down to the place of the dead to bring life again. In fact, it says the message is very close at hand. It's on your lips and in your heart. And that message is the very message about faith that we preach. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you were made right with God. It is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. As the scriptures tell us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jews and Gentiles are the same and the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved but how can they call on him unless they believe in him and how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him how can they hear about him unless someone tells them and how will anyone go and tell them without being sent by the scripture how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good the autocorrect function on our phones is great this autocorrect feature sometimes makes for embarrassing communication faux pas, making you say something completely different than you meant. The same thing can happen in the Christian life when faith gets translated. Try typing on that tiny keypad on your smartphone. You know that it's pretty easy to make a mistake since inside the key as LeBron James is to a smart car. Phone manufacturers know this, and that's why they developed the ostensibly helpful feature called autocorrect, which is supposed to correct your terrible typing into a discernible message for your friend, coworker, or loved one. Problem is that while autocorrect can read your typing, it can't read your mind, and the results are often only examples include a mom reacting to her daughter, you look affordable, she meant you look adorable, but then again, maybe the kid shopped at a thrift store. Mom to son, where are you? Son, I'm having a little I Z U R E. Oh no, I'm calling 911 for you right now. No, Mom, I meant I'm having a little. I'm eating pizza. Susie, hold on a minute. I think there are some Bible badgers at the door. Badgers? Susie, no, Bible bangers. But actually, badgers may not be far off. Guy to friend, how was the date? Friend, awesome, elder at the end, huh? No, I meant I kissed her, stupid autocorrect. You get the idea. You have probably experienced it as well. One word could mean the difference between a great night out or spending the rest of your night, the rest of your life in prison. Sometimes Bible badgers get the words wrong, especially when we're looking at scripture. The apostle Paul is writing to the Roman church that's struggling with a conflict between Jewish Christians who recently returned to Rome after being expelled by the Emperor Claudius and the Gentile converts who likely make up most of the group in the small house churches that dotted the whole city. Paul's trying to help them get their terms right. Since both groups tend to autocorrect their language and understanding back to what they knew before they became followers of Christ. 
Indeed, Paul's been making a particular argument throughout the letter to the Romans, inviting them to take on a common vocabulary. Here's a quick review. You may find it helpful. In Romans 1 and 2, Paul reminds them that everyone, Jew and Gentile, are under a slavery that's way more insidious than your cell phone contract. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He says in verse, chapter 3, verse 23. In chapter 4, Paul reveals God's solution to the problem through the covenant with Abraham, who placed his faith in God and became the father of the nation of Israel, whom God was going to bless so that they in turn would be a blessing to the world, not for their own purposes, but so that they could be a blessing to the world drawing all nations to God. Through Moses, God gave Israel a law as a way of marking them as called out and set apart people. As a side note, from CuriousRead.com comes the following. America is filled with dumb laws, but which are the worst? To our lawyer, we have compiled a list of laws courtesy of dumblaws.com. Now, I've heard of some pretty uh, sweet ones from Rhode Island, but none of these include, I don't think they include in New England at all. 10 of Curious Reed's favorite, the most insane, dumbest laws they could find. They call them the 10 dumbest laws in America, Texas. A recently passed anti-crime law requires criminals to give their victims 24 hours notice, either orally or in writing, and to explain the nature of the crime to be committed. You gonna follow that rule? Law, not just a rule. Nevada, it's illegal to drive a camel on the highway. Colorado, it's illegal to ride a horse while under the influence. Virginia, children are not to go trick-or-treating on Halloween. A special law prohibits an unmarried woman from parachuting on Sunday, or she shall risk arrest, fine, and or jailing. They're going from the lowest to the highest number. California, animals are banned from mating publicly within 1,500 feet of a tavern, school, or place of worship. Wisconsin, margarine may not be substituted for butter in restaurants unless it is requested by the customer. Illinois, you may be arrested for vagrancy if you do not have at least one dollar bill on your person. Nebraska, if a child burps during church, his parents may be arrested. Georgia, donkeys may not be kept in bathtubs. I think we would struggle with any of those laws if we were to have to live in Israel law and run law solution to the world's problem. That pointed what does get out from under it? Focusing will only on sin. Self will will not Christ. It's family that Israel could not be trying to follow the laws. Only Jesus Christ can do that for us. 
What Paul has been doing is mapping out the common language and community that was now possible for both Jews and Gentiles to, to share because of what God had done in Jesus. The language of faith. Whereas the Jews once focused on the law and the Gentiles once focused on philosophy and social status, now their common focus is to be on Christ. This brings us to chapter 10 and Paul's desire that those who are stuck in the old language of law, his fellow Israelites, might still be saved. For being ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God and seeking to establish their own, they have not submitted to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law so that there might be righteousness for everyone who believes. Chapter 10, verses 3 and 4. For Paul, righteousness is another way of talking about God's covenant faithfulness or God's following through. On the plan of rescue, the world had announced to it through Abraham. Christ was the climax of that plan, and now God's covenant faithfulness not only extended to Jews, but to all who believe and have faith in Christ. Problem is, however, that when people want to type faith, they actually mean law and vice versa. Paul defines these terms distinctly in verses five through eight. Moses defined the righteousness that comes from the law as the things that one does, namely adherence to his commandments. Paul never denies that obedience is something that God requires from us, but outward obedience to a set of rules or laws isn't the primary way we become people of God. To truly become people of God requires the righteousness of faith, putting our complete trust in God and patterning our lives after his son. Being copycats, just like our two-year-old, she's learning so much right now by copying whatever people does. And that's what God wants us to do, look to him and be copycats. Faith doesn't spend its energy trying to be so righteous as to go up to heaven to find God, nor does it wait for death to find God either. Faith recognizes that God has come to us in Christ, who descended from heaven and was raised from the dead and returned to heaven. In short, God doesn't require us to be Bible badges. Oh, that was supposed to be Bible bangers. Our faith isn't expressed by cracking people over the head with a Schofield reference Bible and reminding them of the rules they're not following. Nor is it about focusing on the rules as a primary way we can make ourselves acceptable to God. That's auto-correction of the worst sort. Auto, you know, means self. And it's only correction we if the only correction we get is by depending on our own parents to a set of laws, our lives are going to look way sillier than a messed up text message. Instead, Paul says, we are to focus on faith defined as giving our whole allegiance to Christ, and that faith is best expressed in two ways. First, confess with your lips that Jesus Christ is Lord. This is what a person does at baptism, which Paul has already talked about in chapter 6. But this confession isn't just dogmatic agreement to a set of principles about Jesus, like the four spiritual laws. Instead, we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The implication of that confession would have been startling to these Roman Christians. For them to say that Jesus is Lord means that Caesar is not Lord. And to say that meant that they were committing treason against the empire, which was in fact why many of them were sent to their deaths. Confessing Jesus as Lord meant then, and it means now, that we're giving our allegiance to a new world order. 
with Christ as the ruler. We commit treason against the powers of this world and acknowledge that we have no power of our own. To speak of Jesus as Lord is to say we are subjects and that we will order our lives according to his lordship. Second, believe in your hearts that God has raised him from the death. Death is the curse that results from human sin. The law told us what sin was and reminded us of its consequences. Jesus, however, has reversed the curse. In Jesus, God has defeated death, and those who believe their whole direction, and because death has been ultimately defeated for us, that means we can live as people who are free from fear. Salvation isn't just some future hope, it's a present reality. Faith, in other words, isn't a set of rules, it's a way of life. Paul doesn't want us to be autocorrected. He wants us to be Jesus will be put to shame, says Paul in verse 11. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Greek, if you are adorable, when you are in Christ, you will always be made right. But it's not just about getting ourselves Christ corrected, it's about sharing him with the rest of the world that's been constantly getting the wrong message. But whom they have not believed, says Paul. And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim to them? Sharing and living out faith in Christ are the ways in which God uses us to bring his Christ-correcting grace into the world. It's not about badgering people into it, but about sharing the grace and the love of Christ. After all, we, we above all people know that we are bad autocorrectors, but even more, we hate people who are trying to correct. Also know that in Christ, God is making the whole world right, including us. A surgeon said that a good shows how to it's back together again. The law shows us our sin, but the gospel is how God puts us back together again. The New Testament scholar Norman Wright puts it this way, God is putting the world right. So God puts people right so that they may be his right people. As the Jews were blessed to be a blessing, we are to put right so that others by our example can see and know and be put right our own. That's a message that every Christian should be tapping out with their life every day. Let us pray. Oh Lord, our God, we thank you that even confession and believing are gifts from you. Gifts that you will allow, ask, accept. May we grow in our faith, and in our copying of you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let us sing together, Jesus Saves.
Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God, all your all your the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. As you go, keep these commandments ever before. Love God. Love others. In our homes, in our work, and in our neighborhoods, let love always lead. Now go in the deep and wonderful love of Jesus. Amen.